or social media. So I really recommend you get on uh, Twitter. Uh, if you look at my pinned post, you will actually see um, Michael's uh, handle and mine. Obviously, I'm Brian Linuxing. And uh, Michael has a really odd uh, name, um, which comes from his uh, distant past of dealing with DNS. And I will leave him to explain that. Um, we've got, should we wait until 50? And then I think we'll kick off. Um, we should be all right. The intention is we're recording it. Uh, we've, the slides are actually uh, detailed in the meetup page and on Twitter. And we, I will be sending out a email with the content afterwards with a few little things as well. Um, so we just um, share my slides. Um, I've sent the live stream to the chat right now. We'll tweet about it as well. Um, yeah, and then either we just wait for some people or yeah. we can just keep going. Yeah, we're just we're getting a few people coming in now. I'm just adding them slowly. Um, there we go. We've got 51. Um, why don't we start with me doing the little introduction and then Michael can keep adding people as we're going on. And um, that we should, we should be okay. Uh, I'll just do my preliminary slides then pass over to Michael. Should we do that, Michael? Is that good? Yeah, sounds good. Good, lovely. Let me see if, um, let me see. Can you, can everyone see my screen yet? Is it viewable? We can see your screen, but it's played. Excellent, lovely, wonderful. Good evening. Good afternoon, good afternoon. This is the very first Linuxing London virtual event. Uh, and we're very, we're very privileged to have Michael talking about GitLab and CICD. Um, he's gonna do a, uh, about a half an hour, maybe a bit longer, maybe a bit less talk. We'll have some questions and answers, obviously the free raffle and the announcements, then the close of the event. We're gonna try to keep these a bit smaller, than, a bit shorter than we would normally. Uh, because obviously it's quite hard to take it all in. Uh, and we're going to try to do these on a weekly basis, but let's uh, kick off. Uh, right. The slides, Brian. Linux in London. Welcome to Linux in London. Um, we are the largest um, Linux group in Britain. Uh, we're the most active. Uh, we regularly run educational programs. And as I said, this is the first of our virtual events. We're hoping to hold more. The exact format of them is up to grabs. Uh, we're using Zoom in this occasion because it was what we felt would do the job. We may change that in the future. Uh, but let's, let's kick off. First of all, the thank yous. Thank you to everyone at GitLab. They've been absolutely wonderful uh, when I approached them on this topic, and particularly Michael, who's given a lot of his time um, to set this up. Until I started doing presentations, I never realized the struggle that teachers had when they do classes and the rest of it. It takes forever and a day to do things. And I think we've got to be incredibly uh, thankful to Michael for the effort he's put in. He's done the slides and the workshop and the repo, and you can see all that. Um, and I hope we're going to enjoy this. I, th I think GitLab is a really interesting technology and an interesting company. And I think it's the sort of thing we should make an effort to sort of um, follow on. Now, as I said, we, our thank yous. Our thanks to JetBrains, who'll be giving us the lovely prizes, and Tuxedo, who've been very supportive of Linux in London um, for the last year. They're, in fact, a German company who do lovely oh, Linux me, Brian. laptops. Brian. Hello there. Your slides aren't showing. There's just a black screen. Is that right? Let me go back. Thank you. Anything? Maybe you skip a uh, full screen. Um, Let's have a quick look. Isn't this wonderful? Um, uh, I'll try reshare. Share. Try dropping the share and start the share again. Share. Let's have a see. Anything? Yes. Yeah, 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 wonderful. Yeah. Look, look, Linux works. Linux works. Look, to be honest, Eventually. I'm surprised we're, I'm surprised <laughs> we're this far. Uh, right. So there we are. So JetBrains and Tuxedo. So if you ever want a Linux laptop, I can thoroughly recommend them. They are lovely. It's a lovely machine, but I'll talk on that later. Right, so another 
thanks to Canonical, um, who've very, been very supportive of us. Uh, as you'll remember, there is a special day tomorrow where Ubuntu 24 comes out. Uh, I'm hoping we can do an, a, a special event with them covering it. I think this is going to be the release for the next decade. Uh, they've done an amazing amount of work on tidying things up, and um, I'm going to install it on Friday morning. Uh, so if you want to win a prize, remember, tweet the next thing in London, uh, David, and the team will monitor that, and they will tell me who has been witty and wonderful. Uh, obviously, this is, this is our general slides. I, at this point, normally, I would say who hasn't been to one of our events before, um, but it's quite tricky in this particular medium. We specialize in education. We are not just the typical Linux group, the 10 grubby old men with beards who meet down the pub. We believe in educating people and reaching out. So our calendar is very different. It includes computer science, open source, and lots of Linux. Um, and naturally, we try to include everyone. That means not just grumpy old men like me. Uh, we started in 2016. We are now over to 2,800 members. And we've done over 50 events, uh, workshops all the time, training. Um, and we talk to every single company we can to bring them on board to give you education. So if there's a current sexy technology, something that's interesting, I want to get them along to teach our members about it and why they should use it. And that's particularly why we've got Michael talking about GitLab. I think that that is really the future, um, but he will do more of that. So typically, if you come to one of our normal events, we would give away these lovely bits of swag. So at Christmas, we gave away a lovely uh, Alexa show and the Alexa dots and some uh, IoT kit. Obviously, for this particular one, we're going to give away some uh, JetBrains licenses and all of us being stuck in the house is rather tricky, but we're going to try to help uh, cheer people up. Um, so you won't get a raffle ticket, but ask a good question, tweet something nice, and you may get a raffle ticket. A word, of, uh, a word about the code of conduct. We, over the years, we've seen lots of big codes of conduct. I don't think they honest to God work for people particularly people in tech, they want it nice and clear. So really we don't want people to be rude. We don't want people to be racist. We don't want people to be homophobic, transphobic, the lot. It's very clear. And particularly if you're chatting today, don't try to be sarcastic. If anyone's rude or impolite, I will just knock them off completely and ban them. I don't want to do that. And we've only had one person who really didn't get the message. And I'm sure you're, you all wonderful people and won't need uh, saying that. So remember, the code of conduct is very important to us. It's very important to everyone nowadays. We should be extra respectful of people and realize it's a very stressful time for all of us and just act really nice. So we're going to be pleasant to people. That's a little smiley. At this point, we normally have a chat to everyone. But that's not possible because obviously, well, we are uh, stuck using Zoom. Right, so remember, Linux in London is completely free. It's a voluntary uh, organization. Everything is done for free. And we try to bring uh, companies in to give you stuff. So no one's making any money on this. It's quite the opposite. It actually costs us. Uh, but if you'd like to help us out, and we do like uh, people who are help to help us, social skills are more important than technical stuff. I'm an IT manager. I can manage all technical stuff, even Zoom, just about. But we do like people to help us uh, when we have the real events because it gets a bit uh, organizationally difficult when you've got 200 people. So that's that. Remember, Twitter. And so this is, the, uh, this is our future events. We're looking to do about another six virtual events. Uh, I'm provisionally scheduling them with uh, Elton. He's a wonderful person to do Docker and Kubernetes. There's more coming up on... Um, potentially infosec and other wonderful topics. It's, to be honest, it's quite difficult to organize things at the minute, but I will let you know when we've got something firm. We want to do something with the wonderful people from Canonical, uh, but to be honest, they are incredibly busy and it's quite tricky, but don't worry, we are still, we think about you all the time. Uh, everything here was powered by Penguin. Uh, if you like us, you can leave a nice little note uh, this is the agenda. We're a little bit behind. 
and I'm going to pass over to Michael. I'm going to be watching the chat. I'm not watching the meetup page. So if anyone's in there, you know, help yourself. But I've uh, got the span of attention of a budgery gar. So I'm going to be watching the the, uh, the chat page, not much else. Uh, I'm going to pass over to Michael. And if you want to uh, say anything, raise your hand, uh, mute your video, and over to Michael. Well done. Round of applause. It's all okay. All yours, okay. It's all mine. Wonderful. Um, I'm just taking over. And I want to share my desktop. Okay, okay. Um, so uh, Brian told me that I should do basically a more of an introduction to GitLab and also provide some best practices. And my thing is, um, I want to make it as practical as possible. So everything I will be showing you um, can be done as a home exercise as well. So. Um, we will be starting out with the exercises and I will tell you how to fork the repository I've prepared and everything else around it. So if you want, you can just do, see it as a, a live exercise, a live workshop. Um, I might speak too fast, um, but I'm trying my best. That being said, um, um, the things I want to step through today is Short introduction, introducing myself, explaining what GitLab is, what uh, which other which parts it consists, which use cases you you can solve. Um, we also will be looking a little bit into CI/CD, so continuous integration, continuous deployment or delivery. We have some self-practice exercises, and in the end, a short conclusion on that. So I'm hoping that I will be um, in time but let's see about it. A um, little bit about myself. I'm a developer evangelist at GitLab. I've started on March 2nd, so it's basically my second uh, month. Before that, I've been involved in the uh, monitoring community, mainly Isinga, Narios, and, and other variants. Um, so I've helped build the community and also the backend uh, core demon for Isinga and Isinga 2 in the past 11 years. I truly believe in open source. So it's, I've found so many friends and uh, nice people all over the world just because of um, having fun, uh, contributing code, writing documentation, helping community members. So it's all about that. And while I try to reduce that a little in my spare time because I'm doing it all day. So in my spare time, I'm shutting off my brain a little and building Lego models. So I have the large Millennium Falcon, for example, which was a, a nice gift from friends. And I truly love to build a Lego architecture and also just play with children and see how they um, how they go on. Um, I do have a kind of a strange nickname because DNS Mickey or Michi, how we say in the German or Austrian is like, yeah, I cannot change it anymore. Um, normally, I'm picking picking it by, by profession. So it originates from the University of Vienna, where I had been working in the DNS administration department. Um, yeah, so that be it. Um, just call me Michael if you want to. You can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, GitLab, wherever you want. Um, and I've also left a note about our technical evangelism team, which is also rather new at GitLab. We are trying to contribute to open source, not necessarily, not necessarily foster um, uh, the education and the thought leadership around GitLab, but also in open source projects like Kubernetes, Prometheus, um, Jaeger tracing, everything which makes us strong and where we believe um, it, it's worth it to contribute and to educate. On. Um, and my personal blog, um, you can follow my adventure, how how it's going to be the first time being all remote. So for two months now, I need to stay home. Um, so that was planned. I actually was planning to visit you in London, um, but we might do that next year. So let's get actually getting started. So it's, uh, that's the, the front side of the Millennium Falcon or the side side. Um, GitLab defines itself or can be defined the complete tool for the DevOps lifecycle, for the software development lifecycle. So at first glance, we just 
have some code, we create code, we collaborate on that. We kind of need to verify that the code uh, is, is functioning, it's working. So either our source code has, uh, for example, unit tests or end-to-end -end tests and anything else. Um, on the on the side, we also need to take care about managing that thing. So basically tickets, issues, milestones, releases, anything around it. Um, and on the other side, when something is done, you normally want to create a release. You want to say, hey, the version 1.0 is out. I might also need to create a package for that for making it easy to install. And on the other side, when you are leaving the dev side in, in this regard, on, uh, we do have deployments running, um, for example, on Kubernetes clusters or our own environments. And that's the thing, yeah, I actually want to see how the application performance is doing. Did, did one change in time um, affect, for example, the, the MySQL database backend connection and my web cluster or my website is slower than before? That's the things you can also do with that on the deployment side. And um, there are many other different parts. So I'm just trying to keep it short. You, can, you see that there's, a lot, there's lots of things going on with GitLab. Don't be overwhelmed when first starting with GitLab. That's what, I'm, what I want to tell you, because um, at first glance, we should, or we, we should explore what, what GitLab brings us. And I would recommend that we first have a look um, how GitLab itself or what you can do with GitLab. So it's easy, just hop over to gitlab.com and register an account if you don't have any. So I obviously have one. Um, and when, when you do that, basically, so just to show you an example, I am just need to move the participants page around. Um, let's just do it fresh, navigating over here. I do have some projects where I'm assigned to, but basically when I log in, that's my avatar on the right side and I can specify um, several things. So I can set my, my public avatar, my profile and whatnot. And for accessing uh, GitLab, for example, I can manage my SSH keys over here. So I have a pub, uh, public, uh, I have an SSH key pair of which I will be using for cloning and syncing the repository from the local disk to the remote uh, Git server, which is basically hidden inside GitLab. Um, on the other side, I could also go for um, access tokens, which means that I won't be using the SSH transport, but uh, over HTTPS. This is a good thing when you imagine that you travel a lot and ho hotel Wi-Fi's don't allow the SSH port sometimes which is kind of creepy, but yeah, um, you could still use HTTPS and use a personal access token for that. That's basically the thing about the profile. There are many more things you can configure. Um, the most important ones is that you also recognize you can either run a GitLab in a self-hosted variant or on, uh, on the in the cloud. You can assign specific groups and within the groups or for the users, specific permissions and roles. So you have the possibility to say, hey, I'm the owner of the project, I own everything, but my developers are only allowed um, to work on the code, but they're not allowed to create any release or have an effect um, deploying code in production, for instance. Um, you could even uh, say that someone is a reporter, which just means reporting a bug, reporting an issue, but there's no access to code or anything else, which which also is a good thing. Um, next up, let's just see. Um, yeah, we will be working in that lovely repository I, li I linked over here, um, which basically contains some code we will be using. So if you want to work on the exercises right now, um, please fork the repository, should be, I think, should be somewhere over here. Um, and the first thing um, we're gonna explore, we wanna have a look. I think it will be running over time, but anyways, um, 
is how to manage things. So over here, we just see the repository, which is basically our Git repository as, as um, we know about it. Um, but when I say, okay, I have the code now, let's let's create some tasks. I want to actually start managing uh, GitLab inside. Um, we do have the possibility to look into the issues tab and um, it says, okay, we can create an issue. But before we actually start an issue, it's also important to think about labels. So labels um, allow to filter and identify issues. You might know that from, from GitHub already. Um, and you can classify, uh, for example, that being a bug or being a feature or a specific area. And GitLab allows us to just generate a default set of labels, which I will be doing now. And I can see, okay, there is a bug in red. So someone might, might have a look uh, with the signal color. I do have the discussion and suggestion and enhancement. So I can just start using that for my issues I will be creating. Um, but I could also add my own. So if, if for example, I'm doing a, a weekly review on, on new issues, um, I could, for example, create a new label and call it uh, needs dash triage or needs review or needs something else, just to say, there, uh, I want someone else being, uh, there's a requirement to work on that. Let's just make it red. I could also add a description and have my label around. Um, there's also the possibility to define that globally and design and, and then projects in inherit from that. Still, um, you should think about before actually starting the code or work on, on the specific repository. Okay, the next thing is, let's see how I organize the prep. Yeah, we want to um, have, an, have our first issue, but our first issue also needs a milestone. So we want to work on something. And in order to plan ahead, um, we say, okay, we want to create a new milestone. So it's basically located in the same menu. And let's say I want to release the 1.0. We are starting, yeah, maybe we did start yesterday. Um, and due to this today, it's release day. So actually it's also GitLab release day, the 12th of 10 either is released or should be released. Um, depends on the time zone because we all are sync. And okay, the milestone can now be created. And, oh, interesting. Um, the next thing is to actually create an issue. And let's just go over here again. And an issue is basically either I want to add a, a feature request, an enhancement request on the other side, also for a bug report. You could also create meta, meta issues not to not forget things, to collect tasks. Um, even, for example, our, our marketing group, our marketing team is using GitLab for organizing reviews of documents, blog posts, and anything else. So it's not necessarily uh, just bound to, to, tip, uh, to the development workflows, but you could use it for uh, basically anything else you want to organize um, and plan and release at, at a specific time. Um, let's just have a look. I want to improve the documentation. Okie dokie. Then I'd say documentation. And I also have the possibility, and that's, that's kind of important when you start uh, working with GitLab for the first time, um, everything is written in Markdown. So Markdown is a structured language format. Um, you could easily uh, add code blocks, use headings and specific other things. And the nice thing within the description, we also have a preview. And for that, we could also say, okay, I want to create a task list. So a specific format with the dash and the brackets. And I want to first implement, I want to have a feature and the feature also needs um, documentation. And when that basically renders, it will create a task list, which I can click on later on when, when I work on the issue. That's, uh, in my opinion, a little hidden feature. 
Um, we are working on improving that and making that more visible. The other thing I can do is here, I can the issue is, I ha can have an assignee obviously, I can set a due date and I want to assign it to the milestone I just created before. And in that regard, I could also look if I have a specific label I want to apply, yeah, it's documentation and I'm, yeah, I just need, I just use multiple labels. It's also possible um, with labels. It's just a thing. Don't, don't create too many and assign like 10 labels to an issue. And then you, you basically, your workflow on assigning labels takes longer than to create an issue just find the perfect match and just also look how others do it. And now we have our first issue and our first issue needs to be resolved. So when I'm now switching from the role of like, I'm the, I'm the one planning things, um, going, going over to the one who actually uh, implements the things, um, there's the possibility and this is really cool in my opinion. Let's just move into the project overview again. Um, either you clone the repository and work offline in your own IDE, in, in VI, Nano, whatever, um, and then commit and sync the, the changes. Or if you want to like, for example, write documentation or fix, fix a small typo and anything else, you have the possibility to use the web IDE which is located over here and it just opens up kind of um, an ID, ID view with the, the files on the left side which I can edit right now and the thing I want to do here is just to say I'm improving the documentation and my improvement is I, I am doing this live and I am running out of time. Um, and the idea is to say, I can now commit the change. I can create a new branch, for example, feature, um, no, so namespace branches, feature slash improve docs. Um, and I also want to create a merge request. Um, the diff view just says me which line was added. I didn't remove anything. So that's basically um, using Git in the background. And um, now I want to create a merge request out of the web IDE. And this brings me basically to the merge request view. And here I say uh, update docs with more insights, it's kind of a fake, but anyhow. And this is the, this is the cool thing about the merge request workflow. Um, I can use actions like fixes or resolves and then um, use the hashtag for referencing an issue um, to automatically close the issue when the merge request is merged back to master. So I don't need to go an extra mile and just say, okay, now I'm merging the merge request and then I'm looking which issue can be solved Instead, I'm going the way of doing that automatically. Again, if it fits your workflow, you can do it. If, if you still need some sort of more review or one merge request doesn't resolve the issue, you still have the possibility to just leave it out. Um, but it's really cool to show. Sorry. Yes. Someone said they couldn't quite see the top of the screen. Would it be possible to sort of slightly increase it if you can? What do you mean the top of the screen? You mean? Small mentioned it. Um, I think, could, yeah, I, I think that, that that's looking much nicer. I think that's looking much nicer. Yeah, I think that's okay. it. Yeah, that's it. Lovely. Okay. Sorry to interrupt you. I'll let you continue. No, 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 no problem. Um, I have no idea which resolution I'm using on the MacBook, honestly. It's incredibly um, tricky. I'll leave it to you. Okay, okay. Right now, the action is we want to automatically close um, the merge request. Uh, the issue from the merge request. Um, I can still review the changes, which I did, and then I'm just creating the merge request. That's basically the thing. I personally needed to learn that, I think, three or four years ago, because we also were using a different model. 
Um, but with like adopting that, it became tremendously easier. Um, we now have the possibility, so our code is not located in the master branch yet. So if we, for example, um, switch into the, the project, we can see, no, it's not in the master yet. We only have a merge request. Um, I can, um, I can have a prove a prover, so do a review. So right now I'm just saying, okay, I'm simulating a review. I'm looking at that, and then I'm, uh, I might do, for example, I could actually write inline comments, even do suggestions. So I could say, hmm, maybe make this a different smiley. Oops, no, I don't want that. Um, and basically, um, within my review, I can suggest any changes, which is a good thing. Um, right now, I'm saying I'm uh, I'm done. I can apply the suggestions. Let's just do that. It's not in the exercises. I just did that live. And now I say I'm done, and I want to merge the merge request, which in turn means that the source branch is being deleted. That's a nice thing. So I don't need to do any sort of cleanup myself. And I'm checking the issue over here and it was automatically closed, especially because the action was that the merge request um, kills the issue. That's basically the thing. And the more or the often you do it, um, the more it feels familiar. Um, okay, that's the script over here. Um, I also would recommend to like create a test project and try it out. Um, just get, get some time, get one or two hours and play around with it. And I think then it should be, should be in your, in your blood and in your, in your daily workflow. Um, another thing which I also wanted to show you, which is, really cool because it's not just like pushing code or editing things uh, within GitLab, but we also have the possibility to sort of include the Turbo Boost and to, for example, automatically test the code. So each time I change um, a line in my code, um, some configured tests are being run and I can immediately see that it, it might work on my MacBook, but uh, for example, on Ubuntu, I did break it because the C++ library is not there or the interface function changed and I get immediate feedback. So it's not that like the next release is in three months and everyone is like coding, coding, coding. And on the release day, you figure out, oh, the tests are failing. I cannot do the release because I need to fix everything. Um, and the other possibility or option is just to test it on any system, on any like Docker image, Kubernetes cluster, distribution, bare metal, even going for, for ARM architecture for specific embedded hardware. Basically, you can add anything. Um, the idea is similar with having the merge request. And I can, I can also create a draft merge request or VIP merge request, which, oops, sorry, which means um, I have the possibility to um, work on my code as as long as I'm not finished, I'm just leaving it as a work in progress. And I get feedback from like building the software or building the code, which could be, for example, C++, C, Golang, anything which needs to create a binary. Um, for uh, Python, Perl, I could run um, whether the, the linting is okay, um, the Perl, um, the code style applies. Um, the functional tests, which should, should be implemented as unit tests or in a test framework, either built in or anywhere else. Basically everything which is needed um, to make the review and approval even more easier. And when everything is green, um, the one who is doing, uh, who, who is the maintainer can merge back um, to master and everything is green and this is not, this is just you doing one merge request, but just imagine that there are 200 engineers and they're working on everything and everything gets merged. And I personally have no idea how many merge requests are currently um, within Gitmaster for 12.10. 
but I would say like a thousand or two thousand. So it's it can get a lot, and the, the better reviews you have um, before that. Um, the less the um, the risk is that you break anything when re when releasing things, and then everyone says, "Yeah, we are waiting the .zero version. We don't use that in production." But still, if you can't detect specific errors and you need to debug in a customer environment, and it costs you like three months of time, burns out the uh, developers. Just Try to avoid it and make your life easier. As a developer, as an admin, as a manager, basically everyone else, everyone can profit from that or benefit from it. Just to try it out, um, I'm, tr I'm trying to make this quick, but I want to show you something. Um, the easiest way to try it out is just to play around and say, okay, I want to um, use, for example, a Docker image, use the CentOS um, 7 release, and I define um, a job, which I just call test in this example, and it runs a script. It, basically, that's YAML syntax, so you need to get familiar a little with YAML or use uh, the web IDE or um, some online YAML linting or whatever tool you prefer. You can also even auto-generate that from, from different um, uh, configuration management tools, or if you're used uh, to Puppet with Hyra, YAML is everywhere, Ansible is YAML, so you cannot really escape the YAML world. Um, and the thing is, just print something and then uh, use an exit code, exit one is an error, exit zero is, turns it green again, since I'm running a little out of time, I've skipped that example, so home exercise for you. And the thing is, what what can we do with actual code? And um, within the repository, there is some code. So I've created uh, a main.go um, function, or just an entry point for the Golang binary. And it should print something, run something, and we see we see it. Um, the thing it calls is defined in the tanuki.go. It just prints something. We can see we will see that later on. The thing is, um, this code does not have any CI/CD um, configuration right now, so it's just lying there, and I can change the code, commit it, and yeah, it might work, it might not work, I get no feedback. Now the thing is, I might have gotten the code from an old SVN repository, from a colleague, from somewhere else. And the first thing I can do is just to say, okay, it looks like like Go code, it should create a binary, um, why not just test that? And I within the web ID, I have the possibility to create a new file which can be the .gitlab-ci.yaml. I'm just clicking that. And here is the fun part. I can just say, let's search for Go. I can apply a Golang template, which is super nice because I don't need to type that much. The only thing I need to change is I need to copy over the project name. Oops. That's not what I wanted. Um, let's just be lazy. Copy the project URL from over here. Um, but without, yeah, uh, browsers hiding HTTPS, totally funny. Um, we need the repo name because Golang does some GoPath magic over here. And um, I also want to just move it a little over here. I want to rename my binary with Tanuki and the artifact which is generated out of the build job should also be called Tanuki. So um, just to explain that a little um, from uh, what we're going to do is we're using a predefined Docker image uh, for Golang. We are setting specific variables and letting uh, the scripts do some setup. And the most important part is we will have three different stages um, where our jobs are then defined. 
So the format jobs just checks for um, for the syntax is if everything is is fine and also does some tests, and the compile stage um, builds the actual binary. So that basically uh, creates an aesthetic uh, static things binary and outputs that in our project directory. And with using the artifacts keyword or the the setting, we can say okay, I want to actually be able to download the artifact from the job. So um, the GitLab CI run in the background will upload that to GitLab and I can access the binary. I could also like create in the tarball or a specific uh, RPM Debian package and just inspect and download that for testing later on. Okay, less to talking, more the fun. Um, now I will just commit that and we will create a new merge request. Let's just say this is feature slash uh, meetup and we add CI CD config. And yeah, we, yeah, we could create a merge request now. Um, and our timing is not my, my strength. Um, let's just call it VIP right now and just keep working on that. So the thing which happens now is could not retrieve my pipeline status. This is not what I wanted. Um, let's just check the meetup branch over here. And either you can access the pipeline running state over here, or you navigate into CI CD in the menu into the pipelines. And you can see that um, the feature meetup branch is currently running and I can click on that and see, okay, there is the test in the build stage and there are two jobs. The format job is currently running and it fails. Hmm, that's interesting. Um, so it tells me um, some code uses an undeclared name FMT format library. So maybe the code is just um, broken in that regard. We might have a look and fix that. So over here, I'm changing back into our meetup branch and changing back into the web IDE. Let's just see. It told us that FMT is not found in that regard. Intentionally, I've prepared it to just being able to show you, we need to import the library and then uh, we should be good to go. And the nice thing over here, when I'm fixing that in the web IDE, um, I will commit to the branch. I will fix missing uh, library import. That's a good commit message. We commit the change and over here on the right uh, upper corner, I have the the rocket icon and the pipelines, and I can I don't need need to uh, leave the context. I can just um, inspect what I will be uh, what the, the CI/CD pipelines are doing. So I can say, okay, this might open basically in a new window. Takes a little while, um, so. In that regard, just hoping that it will work. Um, the thing you can do, and this is, I think this isn't, isn't in the slides, uh, GitLab has, a, has its own uh, container registry. So you, if you want to use container images, Docker images, you could ju just enable or just use uh, the container registry. I think it's enabled since 12.6 or something. Um, and you can use it in your local DMZ and create your own images. Um, this is a matter of uh, like security and also your own um, things. Um, so if Docker Hub is down for some reason, or maybe it's, it will always be down after a while, um, we do have the possibility to um, just not depend on any external sources and just use our own uh, local GitLab instance. So if you're planning to host it by yourself, for example. Um, 
the jobs communicate by the communicate by themselves. So any artifact which would be created by the job um, on its own uh, will be passed to the next job by the runner. So um, there's not not really the the necessary. It's not really necessary um, to um, to always define the artifacts um, keyword within the uh, jobs and stages. Artifacts are automatically shared. And over here, you can see, since we specified the artifact, I could just download one or download the artifact. So the job or the runner synced it to GitLab and we could just download that and run it on our own. But um, there's one thing which I can also do. I can also just run it. So coming back to our GitLab CI or CI CD configuration, um, I actually want to add a new test, which I or a new job, which I just say, okay, let's call it deploy. We are adding it to the stage um, deploy. Or maybe just we run um, something, and our script should be um, running the Tanuki binary we just created before. I think that's, that's actually the solution I've been trying. Yeah. Sorry. Um, and with that, um, let's see how should we call that. Um, add deploy run job. Okay, okay. Let's commit that. And yeah, sometimes the refresh is not that good. Um, but I've told our engineers already about it. Um, so the next time it will just be running. And since this takes a little while, I will just continue. Just trying to rush over the. The more things we, we also have to do, um, or what I wanted to share with you, um, there are specific unit test frameworks around. So if you're planning to write um, unit tests for your software, you might know about PyTest or uh, TAP, which is uh, the thing for Perl. For C++, you could use the Boost uh, test framework. Um, for Golang, for example, you have that built in. So um, the project I have been creating also has um, the I'll just check where is it over here. Um, any file or just the function or the, the, the file name with using an underscore and test. Um, you could just use the Golang test uh, framework and write your own tests. Um, define some things, run over the tests and check whether, for example, a string is contained in, in the function call. So in that regard, it just calls the get Tanuki function which is defined on the other side. And with uh, running go test then as an um, as a CLI command or in the CI template, um, you immediately get any feedback. And if you break your tests, so the more tests you have, the better, um, you immediately see that some code change which should improve the performance actually broke everything else. Um, and I think, I think that's a good thing because uh, like 10 years ago, we didn't have any unit tests and it was not so funny debugging at the customer why some specific architecture was segfaulting, but it didn't segfault one hour after running it, but three days after, which is kind of total clusterfuck. Um, anyhow, we, uh, let me just check if we have some success on the job. Yeah, maybe, hopefully. Um, and this is basically the last thing I wanted to show. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Let me just check. Do we have something else? Yeah, you could also create batches and add them to the readme. So you get a, an immediate view in the pipeline status if you want that. And uh, what I want to encourage you is to test that workflow. If you want to use the web IDE even more, because I really love to do it, I also use it on my iPad. Um, you can just try to do that. Um, let's just see. 
yeah. So the Tanuki is being run. It says hello. We have our nice Tanuki over here and okay. Sometimes Mac is not that cool. Um it says open up this nice web page. This is a uh, kind of a demo site with Clippy and some animations. Um, I also recently added some jumping things. Um, so yeah, everyone can contribute. And um, with that, I know that I'm over time anyhow. That's the things we learned today. Um, hopefully you can use that knowledge. Uh, you can like jump into GitLab. If you do have any questions, anything else right now, I know I've told my colleagues already that will uh, that I will be a little late for the next meeting. Um, the release should be out today, maybe. Um, let's just click on the link. I prepared it. No, it's not yet released, but okay, we need to wait a little longer. And yeah, we do have some online trainings, um, but I think we could also use uh, or you do some some more workshops and some more introductions and work together hopefully at some point um, in person. And I uh, recently also blocked about my development environment with dot files and anything else. So I hope you can use everything. Um, yeah, thanks for your time. Well, can we have a uh, virtual round of applause? Thank you very much, Michael. That was really interesting. Uh, God, there's a lot to take in, isn't there? I mean, it is uh, really, really sizable. Um, questions. We had some questions from uh, Yossi on the difference between GitHub and GitLab. Um, do you want me to, because I can quickly give that a an answer for, that would, for it. wouldn't be so politically, I, I'm not connected with either. Um, my impression is that the latter, obviously GitLab is more integrated. So I want to do a lot of CI, CD for my work and ticketing and what have you. And that means I don't have to actually learn Circle CI, you know, the various GitHub actions. I've got one single place to learn. I mean, the totality is a bit, it's, there's a lot to take in, but once you've learned it, that's it. And you've got the GitOps function, which I'll be honest, we've been using a bit for organizing some uh, events and it, I mean, it takes a bit of getting used to, but it, it, it does work and it does track things. Um, but yeah, that's a big topic. Um, then we had a question from uh, Clyde on following users, which um, obviously you can do on GitHub. Um, and that isn't a feature yet, as far as. Yeah, I the main thing is people just upvote that two year old feature request. That's the main reason I don't use GitLab. Yeah. But that's a personal thing for me. Um, and then with the really, the really, I, which I think was the best question, uh, which was from Didar, on templates and are they universally accessible? Which is, where are we? Where are we? Let me, let me find the full one. Um, yeah, she said, um, are those templates available to all GitLab users or specific to organizations, Michael. Uh, is that related to the CI template I just showed? Yes. So they are, so they are, I don't know if they are still in a set, in a specific repository, but they are inside the source code. And if you have a such, um, if you want to improve, help improve that, you can just access that. So any installation which uh, uses which is up to date, let's call it like that, um, should have the templates. And these templates are somewhat generic, but sometimes you might need to like change them a little or adopt them. But I think they're on a good way to becoming the best practices you want to just start with. So when I started with GitLab four years ago or something like that, we didn't have any templates or they were just hidden in the, in the documentation somewhere and was was like, Hmm, how can I start with that? Yeah, maybe I, sh I should uh, start simple, create one job, compile something, gather some feedback, learn how the Docker executor works, learn how I can run it natively on, on Linux or Windows with PowerShell, for example. Um, 
you could even um, install the runner on Mac OS or um, uh, on ARM. So basically, um, if you got the hardware, you could uh, let the runner run on, on a Raspberry Pi, for instance, and connect it with GitLab and build something. Interesting, interesting. Um, so the other questions we've had, uh, I'm looking, obviously someone's asked about a simple guide. Uh, yes, that would be uh, wonderful to have. I think that they've got a lot of documentation. What I will try to do is get some links and put them out together uh, when we sh when we go there. Um, is there, are there any other questions um, on the chat? Before we sort of tidy up, I know Michael's a bit busy. Any other questions? Well, I'm just scrolling over the chat. I didn't read it, so I'm not that multitasking. Um, I think a lot of it does come down to the, the totality of trying to under. I mean, let's be honest. You're trying to explain something which could take a day or three days to explain in. The best part of 40 minutes and you know naturally that sort of, uh, yeah honestly hard, but, um, honestly i wanted to show you the getting started easily and why you should care about cicd which is totally it's nearly impossible to bring it in 30 minutes so it took me 45 i think um but still it should give give you the the desire to try it out and if you need something, I'm available on Twitter. You can like poke me. We have the forums. My colleagues are over there. Um, there are also, so Brian is active in the uh, in the GitLab meetup group for um, for London as well. So there are virtual meetups. Um, I don't know. I think the next one will be next week. I, I think so. Just, just um, go hop over to the website and just uh look it up i'd say mm. i've also i've also seen uh like the color match of the slide and your t-shirt michael yeah i really love the t-shirt um you can also get it on the gitlab shop so i got it as a present but it's available in the swag store i i should actually say that i i don't have a ironically i don't have a gitlab um, t-shirt i have a microsoft t-shirt i have aws t-shirt I think I have a Google T-shirt, but it's funny I don't have a GitLab one. Yeah, then, uh, then right. Should, so we're going to come. Go on. You should send send me your uh, size in private <laughs> and your address, and I will I will try to like do some magic. Well, no, no, I, I don't want to do preferential treatment. Preferential treatment. That's, that's not me. Anyway, we'll chat later on that. Uh, a hoodie might be good, but anyway, but uh, yeah, right. So the raffle. Everyone's interested in the raffle, aren't you? Yes. Um, yeah. So. Uh, the raffle, uh, Clyde won it for uh, a very nice uh, tweet. Not enough people tweeted, I'll be honest. And I think Didar's question, you know, was uh, probably uh, the most pointed. Uh, and both of you win a JetBrains license. What you should do, this is the instruction, is send me an email. Now, Everyone can work out my email. It's the same as my Twitter account. It's the same as my GitLab account. It's the same as my GitHub account. It's even the same as my speaker deck uh, user ID, which is brianlinuxing at Gmail. Uh, so if you send me uh, an email, remind me about the JetBrains license, I will then send one back to you. That would be lovely. Um, I've just had confirmation from Elton that we are go for next Thursday, uh, three o'clock. I think next time we're going to open up a little bit earlier, have a little bit of a chat, because it, to be honest, it is a bit odd. I mean, I have to admit this. I find this a bit of an odd way of doing it. Um, but I think it, it's gone well. Uh, we're going to, uh, this is recorded, so you'll be able to walk through what Michael has done, see the slides, you know, do the repo. It's going to take a bit of time to uh, pick up. Uh, but I think this is a very first, a good first step. I hope you all enjoyed it, and uh, I'll try to do more when I can grab someone um, from uh, GitLab. Thank you all for attending. Um, we're a little bit late, um, but it's been wonderful, and I'm going to give Michael another clap because he's a, he's a wonderful person, and I hope he has a nice cup of coffee now and a rest. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you, and I will chat to you.
that um we will call it a uh, night and i will see everyone next thursday i'll put the links in the meetup please do read the comments and uh, bear with us because it's all very new and novel and uh, very funky thank you so much bye bye bye